Exactly. So, so on. May I start? Already no. Ah, you did. Are you the chairman or? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so you can either have this or you can have the fixed microphone. So, uh, uh, welcome back uh, everybody. My name is uh, Alessandro Laio. Uh, I work here in Sissa, close by. Uh, I have the honor to chair this uh, session. So this session is dedicated to a, a, a field which, whose importance uh, is uh, really booming. Uh, in many, many communities, and in fact, it's a field that at the border between different communities, and this is the field of, uh, well, using uh, and developing machine learning techniques uh, in the context of uh, uh, solid state physics and material science. Uh, in this session, we are going to have uh, two uh, really eminent exponents of this new community which is uh, uh, coming out, uh, Michele Ceriotti and Gabor Ciani. Uh, they both contributed to these uh, newborn fields, uh, well, really milestones, ideas which are now uh, uh, stimulating a lot of research uh, everywhere. Uh, I am among the ones that uh, have now learned to use uh, these techniques developed by these two guys, uh, well, in my own uh, research for, uh, well, several different uh, applications. So I really very much look forward to hear their talk. Uh, I think the first speaker is uh, Gabor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much and, uh, and welcome. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be back at this, um, I guess, what is a temple of, uh, of solid state physics and electronic structure theory. Um, so my talk is about uh, interatomic potentials from first principles, which is one of the uh, applications uh, of, of machine learning in solid state physics. And it's the one that, that I'm really interested in, that I've made contributions to. Um, I want to start uh, by sort of showing you that this has been a, a long time in the making. It, it, I, it is sort of more than a decade old promise where I think partly, at least on one occasion in this room, uh, Michele Parinello uh, was talking about their um, uh, high dimensional neural network potentials. And a couple of years later, um, our first publication in this field. And, and we promised to this community, to uh, our friends with whom we were doing density functional calculations for many years, that um, we can do those things much, much, much faster, thousands, millions of times faster. Uh, molecular dynamics will be uh, available. And I want to sort of update you. I want to tell you what happened in the last 10 years uh, and where we are with that. And um, I'm very happy to say that we now have applications. And I want to take you through a little bit of the condensed, mature version of what, what we do, the, the, the theory behind these fits, uh, and then just, just indicate, uh, really just flash it up, uh, how it's being used um, these days. So um, what are interatomic potentials? So really, there are three communities uh, that are actually disjoint. Uh, and that's been a, a problem, a learning curve uh, for me. And, and I hope that, that actually this approach uh, the machine learning approach is what the one which can bring them together. So the first community is really the community of, of force fields, organic force fields in biochemistry. Um, think of all these uh, different packages and, uh, and methods. And their transferability is, is key and, and really the reason uh, that, 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 that that field is, is, has been so successful. So you, you take some functional forms that are well-founded uh, and you uh, parameterize them using small molecules, and then you go on to simulate proteins. And that works fantastically well. Then um, there is another community, and really 
very separate, uh, which is interested in, in uh, solid state materials and their different phases, uh, bond, uh, melting, defects, and that community, in that community, again, potentials are created, they must, must be reactive, so you must, break, must be able to break and form bonds, uh, which is not the case typically in the organic force field. And again, you will recognize many of these functional forms, and this is the community of physicists and material scientists. And then there's a third community, uh, again, pretty disjoint from the others, and that's the community of um, quantum chemists. And they are interested in um, very small molecules or molecular clusters, a couple of waters, maybe an ion. And they are in the business of creating um, fits to the potential energy of those systems as calculated by the best possible quantum chemistry, like coupled cluster theory from the previous talk, and, and making those fits very, very accurate, spectroscopically accurate, that you can compute hundreds of thousands of infrared lines, and they do match experiment. And the goal that the long-term vision that I have is really to unite these three, uh, edge, three corners of this triangle, to retain the accuracy and many of the attitudes of these people, but make them transferable to large systems and make them reactive and applicable to the materials uh, uh, that, uh, that lots of us are interested in. So that's sort of the, the end goal. So first, I think one has to ask, and, and I didn't ask for many years uh, while doing it is, is it, is this actually possible? So if we think about density functional theory or any other uh, description of quantum mechanics, um, is it actually possible to reduce it to a potential energy surface and then um, fit that uh, with analytic functions accurately? And really, um, all of us start and never really transcend the separation of short and long range interactions when we do that. And the rest of the talk will really focus on the short range interactions. So I do have to say something about long range interactions because quantum mechanics is long range, right? So when you solve the Schrodinger equation in whatever approximation, you do have charge transfer. Uh, you have polarizable electrostatics and Van der Waals interactions and they make atoms far away from each other interact. And really there are three things that one can do with those long range interactions. Either we study systems in which those are small enough that we can ignore them and still get um, methods and potentials that are very, very useful. And most of this talk will be about such systems. Um, one could say we have analytic forms of some of those interactions. So a point charge Coulomb model may be good enough for what we want to do and we subtract them before the fitting process and add, the, add it back afterwards, and that's it. Or, sort of tantalizingly, something that I haven't certainly entered into, but I'm interested in it, is that one could try and, and, on, and, and also use fitting technology to parameterize such long-range interactions. And one of the exemplar systems, so after you want to do one of these things, the question is how local is the remainder? Either after ignoring the long range, after subtracting it, or after parameterizing it, is Walter Cohn's short nearsightedness of electrons, how does that extend to atoms? Are atoms also nearsighted? And one of my favorite systems in which to think about this is, is amorphous carbon. You can have very low density amorphous carbon full of sp and sp2 bonds, and you find if you test this that, that atoms are really not short range, right? So you perturb an atom and forces on atoms very far away change. And you can go to very high density diamond-like carbon which is a very, very short range material. If you perturb an atom here, only the first few neighbors uh, have forces that are changed. So in order to, uh, the rest of the talk is about short range interactions, assuming you've done one of these. And now I want to spend the next few slides telling you about function fitting. And it will look very elementary at the beginning, and the surprise is that that's really all you need. But one key idea is dimensionality. So if you have a, if you want to fit functions in few dimensions, let's say this is a one dimension uh, and this is a one dimensional function, and I give you some data, um, for a, from a physics perspective, it is not a deep problem to make a, an interpolation of these points. If I ask you to draw it, you will all come up with something like that. 
That doesn't mean, I don't mean to say that there are no mathematically interesting uh, issues in this. You can have, write books about the accuracy of various approximations in the various limits. But from a physics perspective, these functions are not going to be, not going to look very different. And the real reason for that is that we can get enough data to really fill this space. And once we fill that space, mathematicians can tell us about universal basis functions, polynomials, splines, Gaussians, and they can study their convergence properties, but they all essentially lead to the same answers. And that is on contrast with fitting interactions of functions in many dimensions, which is what we're going to want to do. Right? So to, to get the short range part of quantum mechanics accurately, we will want to fit functions of, say, the energy of an atom as a function of its 20 nearest neighbors. And that's a 60 dimensional space. So it's very large. So in high dimensions, you get data, but the data doesn't fill the space. It's sort of very sparse. And the, because when the data is very sparse, really the only thing you can do, and this is at the very heart of every machine learning method, is that you, have, you use basis functions to fit, to construct your functions, and those basis functions need to live where the data lives. If I try to use a regular grid in 60 dimensions, I have too many grid points. So, so, those, so these, these, these typical uh, splines and polynomials that, that work in low dimensions don't work in high dimensions. And that is the essence of machine learning. It's actually finding basis functions, suitable basis functions, induced by the data. Typically, basis functions are local. And so I can fit functions that I want where the data lives. OK, so how do we do this? I like to do linear regression in many dimensions. So suppose that you have atomic configurations indexed by these um, curly uh, letters, so A, B, C, and so on. And I have some observations in the space of atomic configurations. Let's call them Y. And let's say I have N observations, and I'm going to want to use not all of them, but some of them to represent my functions, induce uh, basis functions using some kernel. So the kernel is, you can think of it as a, as a function of two parameters, or two, taking two co atomic configurations, and by placing one of them where your data is, it induces a basis function. I'm going to tell you later what the kernel is, but just think of it abstractly as some local function in atomic configuration space. And any function that I want to fit, be that the energy of an atom, be the polarizability of something, or a charge induced on an atom, uh, is going to be written as a linear combination of these kernel functions. And this, right, so A is the free variable here. I can choose any atomic configuration and evaluate uh, this function there, and B is going to range over some representative configurations, and K, A, B are the induced uh, values of the induced basis. And you can, think that, you can see that this is a, essentially a dot product. I have unknown a vector of coefficients x. I can collect them into this vector, and this, this vector K is the, is the vector of the basis functions over all of my representative configurations, and the other argument is where I'm trying to evaluate. And this, this K is a, is a row of a K matrix that is M by N. So it's, it's essentially, it's also called the design matrix. It's all the basis function values connecting the representations, uh, connecting the observations and the representative configurations. So this is an easy problem to solve for the unknown coefficients. It's a linear least squares problem. You are looking for the best fit. So KX should equal Y. It's not going to equal it exactly, but I'm looking for the unknown coefficients x, which minimize uh, the error. If you actually implemented that, it turns out that that's, uh, uh, it's very unstable, but, but it has an analytic answer, right? So if m is equal to n, if I use all of my representations as, all of my observations as induced in representative configurations, then all I have to do is invert this k, and that's my x. Typically, we don't want to do that. There are too many, many observations, and we don't need all of them to induce basis functions. So if m is much less than n, then instead of k inverse, we use the pseudo inverse, right? So that's a, a, just a slightly more complicated linear algebra expression of a non-square matrix 
multiplying the observations, and that gives you the coefficients. If you implemented this directly, um, it's extremely unstable. Um, oh, just notice that this is order n cubed, whereas this is order n, so linear in the number of observations, which is a much nicer place to be. Um, but, uh, but it's unstable, but it can be stabilized. And that's a 50-year-old theory. So Tikhonov uh, invented a way of regularizing these, these inversions. And essentially what Tikhonov says is that instead of minimizing the best fit, um, you should also try to minimize the magnitude of the coefficients. And there are sort of very deep geometric reasons why this is the right thing to do. Uh, if you minimize this combination, uh, then you get very, pretty good fits, not the best possible fit, but pretty good fits that are also very smooth. Um, the amazing thing about the Tikhonov regularization is that you retain the analytic answer. So this is an analytic solution of this minimization problem. If I add this to it, there is still an analytic answer. And it's this simple when m is equal to n. Um, and uh, if m is not equal to n, I'm in this pseudo-inverse case. That is the analytical answer to this minimization problem. Lambda here is a diagonal matrix that contains weights. So you, weight different, you can weight different configurations uh, by different amounts. And that is, in fact, is what we have in our codes. The only thing that I'm hiding in the interest of time and the difference between a talk and a detailed paper is how we pick the representative configurations and questions of derivatives, right? So I'm just talking about observations, uh, why, whereas in reality we observe energies and forces uh, and various other gradients. So that's, that, that's the only thing that makes uh, the real code slightly more complicated than this. Um, is that we have derivatives and, and the selection algorithm. Uh, there is, I'm going to want to talk to you about error bars. And the way we, uh, th there's a very nice theory, which I'm just going to quote here, that this linear least squares fitting has a counterpart in probability theory. And that is the probability theory of Gaussian processes. So um, there is an alternative derivation of, of the previous result in which you think about uh, having a probability distribution of functions over all the observations, and then asking what's the probability of predicting the next observation. And that theory results in the same answer as the previous linear least square solution. Um, the, the average of the posterior probability has the exact same formula. But when you go through this probabilistic derivation, you also get the covariance. And I'm illustrating that here. Suppose these are the observations uh, that I make. This is just a one-dimensional example. I can draw multiple samples from, from this posterior distribution. And you see that they ag all agree very near the data points, but they disagree where I don't have data. And that's, that we can consider that as an error bar. So this shaded region is now the, the, the variance around the mean. And you don't get that from the linear algebra view. You only get that from this probabilistic view. Um, and this is what inspired us originally to call the application of all of this to, um, to interatomic potentials. We call it Gaussian approximation potentials, because these distributions that you assume here are multivariate Gaussian distributions. We call it GAP. Um, and the, the reason people really like this is it comes with a theorem. So if you use Gaussian kernels, as the number of observation goes to infinity, as long as the number of, as long as the function you're trying to represent is reasonably regular and the number of representative configurations is, uh, is order n, so m is order n, then you're guaranteed that the error goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And that's a really nice thing. We have a universal approximator. And the function that you obtain is, a, is going to be a sum of your kernel function, sum of Gaussians, so it's going to be infinitely differentiable arbitrarily close to your target function, whether that is infinitely differentiable or not. You can get very close to it. And uh, I want to just close this section by quoting uh, my favorite public speaker and, and mathematician, Hannah Fry from UCL, um, on a radio program last year. Where she said, oh, there's a lot of talk about a revolution in artificial intelligence. There is no such thing. But there is a revolution in computational statistics, and it's fantastically exciting. And that's what lots of us are working in. So don't believe the hype, that hype. Believe the other hype. Um, so let's get back to, uh, to physics. Uh, 
And the, the anatomy of an interatomic potential, um, these are the things that you need. So you need a representation. We need to think about how we're going to say where the atoms are. We need a regression method. We need to think about what function we're going to approximate and where we're going to get data. So traditionally, in potential making, people are representing uh, configurations using bond lengths and angles and maybe torsions. I want to um, tell you uh, about, uh, in the next couple of slides, how we represent configurations by their neighbor density. We want many body representations, not just bond lengths and angles. Um, so I want to think about the complete environment of an atom. Then, when it comes to regression, uh, traditionally parametric functions have been used, but uh, in the quantum chemistry community, invariant polynomials have been used for, uh, and the body order expansion for two, three, four body uh, terms. Artificial neural networks are a way of regressing data, uh, and the kernel, uh, the Gaussian processes that I uh, outlined before is just a way of, uh, of, of, of doing regression. The function that you're trying to fit, um, we could do a body order expansion, we can, and, and very often people do that. Think about pairs of atoms, triplets of atoms, pairs of molecules, energies of triplets of molecules. But in the condensed phase, we really want to think about entire periodic systems. So the, the total energy uh, of, uh, of many atoms together, and that's what I'm mostly interested in. And finally, um, of course, we need target data, uh, and if you're going through this sort of upper route, so simple functions, parametric functions, and body order expansions, you're thinking about a couple of molecules, uh, very often you're able to incorporate experimental data in these fits. But if you're going towards the bottom of these choices, complicated neighbor density descriptors, kernel regression, total energies, then quantum chemistry and and solid state physics, the density functional theory, uh, is where we, the data is going to come from. So um, I want to tell you what our kernel function is. Um, and in order to do that, we need to think about the representation of, of atoms. So I introduce the atomic neighbor density function. So you think about an atom in the middle, and it has some neighbors. And you could think about putting a delta function at each of the, the locations of each of the neighboring atoms and summing them up, and that density rho of r is a representation of the neighborhood. Um, very, very quickly, uh, one realizes that it's much, much nicer to work with smeared atoms because it's going to lead to much smoother functions when we're going to build functions out of this uh, neighbor density. So imagine Gaussians placed, centered on your neighbors, and maybe even with a cutoff function that smoothly cuts them off as they exit some, uh, some radius. And so we have a representation that is translationally invariant. It doesn't matter where my atom is. This row of R function is centered on each atom. There's permutation invariance because this sum doesn't care in which order I add up uh, my neighbors. Um, it's continuous, uh, especially if I have a continuous cutoff function. But it's not rotationally invariant. I like my an atomic energy functions to not change when I rotate the entire system. Uh, and, and this function certainly isn't rotationally invariant. And, and everybody solves that essentially by projecting this density onto rotationally invariant basis sets. So, so baylor parnello symmetry functions, which were part of the, the original proposal, can be considered a projection of this neighbor density. And there are many, many others. You can make histograms of bond lengths and angles within your neighborhood. And that's sort of a projection of this. Um, the next talk, Michele Ceriotti will, will, will go into more detail about these connections. But um, our favorite choice uh, is, to, uh, uh, is to take this atomic density um, and perform, a, a, essentially, a, construct a kernel directly. So we do, remember, we need a, a kernel function. Uh, and we can take two of these densities so of two different neighboring environments, and multiply them and integrate. And that's an overlap, and that's a, a kernel, but it's not rotationally invariant. But we can make it rotationally invariant by taking this overlap function, squaring it, and applying all possible rotations to it and integrating this square, squared overlap across all possible rotations. And that is a six-dimensional integral, three spatial integrals here and three rotational integrals. And it is a very nice kernel, but it would be pretty difficult to calculate for each of the basis functions. You would need to perform a six-dimensional integral. 
But it turns out that if you expand this neighbor density into spherical harmonics, taking your favorite um, radial basis set, I'm calling it GN here, YLM are spherical harmonics, you have some CNLM expansion coefficients. It turns out after rather a lot of algebra that this integrated overlap is exactly equal to the dot product of what we call a power spectrum P, which is just C dagger C. Okay, so contemplate this for a few seconds. You take the neighbor density, you expand it in spherical harmonics, you square it, C dagger C gives you a rotational invariant. Actually, some elements of this are the well-known Steinhardt bond order parameters, Q246, um, which are used to characterize crystals. And if you take dot products between these um, power spectra, then that is exactly equal to the K, to the kernel that I defined here. So that's sort of a, a profound result. And that's, in fact, what we use. So the kernel uh, functions and kernel matrices uh, are just a, a small integer power of this uh, rotated integrated overlap. The nice thing about this from a physicist's point of view is there are very few free parameters. So really, the cutoff function, uh, this sigma, which is the smearing of the, of the atoms, the cutoff, the smearing, and this small integer, which is typically four. Uh, and that's it. So all of this, there is very, 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 very few things to tune. So now I want to show you that this really works. So the first few demonstrations that if I give density functional theory data to this system, to this framework, I get density functional accuracy at a much, much, much reduced cost. So here's a, here are a few examples. Um, here's tungsten. Tungsten is difficult. It's a BCC uh, metal. Um, and these are three different, um, three different uh, interatomic potentials across the decades. Um, so a Finney Sinclair potential, an MEAM, uh, and the bond order potential, and this is the DFT uh, reference um, error with respect to DFT reference for a bunch of properties. And you can see that not a lot of accuracy progress has been made. Understanding progress, yes, but, but not accuracy. If you put this through the, the SOAP kernel, smooth overlap of uh, atomic positions that I just described, and the Gaussian uh, approximation potential, you get these points. And I didn't cheat. This is, this, this, that's real data. So it's not exactly, the error isn't exactly zero. It's a milli EV per atom accuracy. The database are small unit cells, MD on small, less than, typically less than 128 atom unit cells. Um, we can go further. Here's uh, iron, an even more difficult system. It's also BCC. Contributions from here are from Daniel Dragoni and Nicola Marzari, who are also here. Um, and it was much harder to do than tungsten. Um, we, it was so expensive to get the DFT data that we had to use non-uniform K-point sampling and pay extreme uh, care uh, when setting the DFT parameters. And uh, when we did this first, and we computed the thermal expansion, this is experiment, this is the, the DFT, which gets the volume slightly wrong, but otherwise, qualitatively is correct, and our gap model was okay at low temperature, but really was a bit unstable. And it turned out that we weren't honoring our own promise of being careful enough, um, because what turns out that when we use the noise, per, the, the weights in the regression to compensate for the inadequate k-point sampling of large cells, large unit cells being slightly inconsistent with the small ones, once we fix that, we get a perfect reproduction of um, the thermal expansion. The last example uh, is what I call a silicon challenge, right? Ten years ago, when we made all these promises, we said, let's make a potential that just does everything. Can we, act, in fact, do that? And <laughs> silicon is the material uh, in which to try. Um, here are lots and lots of different uh, crystal structures have been described in the literature. Can we cover, can we have a database of DFT calculations that covers all relevant configurations? The answer is that we can. This is from earlier. This is just at the end of last year. Um, here's a bunch of different um, things you'd like to compute, elastic constant, surface energies, point defects. Here are the best potentials on the market, from uh, early Stinger Weber to ReactsFF to even a tight binding model. And you can see that really the DFT errors are all over the place. The 
machine learned model is really very, very, very good. There are some untargeted properties that are really very far from what we had in the database. And it's really not bad for those either. Not as good as for the targeted properties, but, um, but not, not much uh, worse. Um, I want to finish with, um, I want to finish with transferability and, and, and future thoughts in the last minute. Um, the most stringent tests that we can think of are crystal structure search. So here's crystal structure search from random initial conditions with all the different potentials. And uh, instead of letting you stare at those points, let me just give you convex hulls. And the machine learned model is the only one that's vaguely sensible compared to the density functional theory. Right? Black and red are those. Um, so what is, um, ah, I can't skip uh, seven by seven reconstructions, especially with this audience. So this is the first interatomic potential that gets this extremely delicate seven by seven and two by one uh, reconstructions on silicon surfaces. Here are what the other potentials do. Here's what you get with these DAS reconstructions as a function of unit cell size. And you can see that the uh, uh, density functional theory answers that these five by five and seven by seven are 0.01 joules per square meter difference. Um, are the lowest energy states is correctly reproduced. Um, so I'm not going to talk through these, but in the last year alone, these are the materials for which we produced potentials and not just shown that they work, but actually did science. So all of these materials had outstanding scientific questions about um, growth of carbon films, about defectless silicon uh, amorphous structures, screw dislocation glide in BCC iron, medium range order in uh, germanium antimony telluride. All of these are very active research fields and it, accurate interatomic potentials make the difference. So here's the vision uh, really um, for making interatomic potentials uh, for the world. So you start with some baseline, maybe incorporate strong internuclear repulsion. You may need to have electrostatics, depending on the system. I think we've solved the short range bonding problem and also many body dispersion. I didn't talk about that. Um, and we can add on to this body ordered corrections from wave function chemistry. Again, that's old work that's been done. But I think if you put all of these things together with the missing piece, really, the fitted electrostatics, we do have the possibility of making potentials uh, that, uh, that can do large scale and be very, very accurately. Um, I'm just going to leave these up. These are things we're currently working on. Thank you.